incentivizing MSSPs to expand and diversify their tool sets, and the impact of generative AI on cybersecurity. That and the latest news and trends in the managed security space coming up next on Cyber for Hire. Building bridges between managed security providers and their clients, it's the podcast where MSPs, VCSOs, and end users take a united stand against cybercrime. This is Cyber for Hire. Chasing false positives, battling alert fatigue, finding the proverbial needle in a haystack. It all leads to cybersecurity staff burnout and increased security risk. Check out Managed XDR from NetSurian. NetSurian's open XDR platform unifies your telemetry for wider attack surface coverage, deeper threat detection, and ultimately faster incident response. And NetSurian SOC empowers your team by doing the heavy lifting with continuous monitoring, proactive threat hunting, and guided remediation. Looking for a true partner instead of another vendor? Visit MSSPAlert.com slash NetSurian. All right, welcome, welcome to episode number lucky seven of Cyber for Hire. How's everybody doing today? I'm Bradley Barth with SC Media in New York. And joining me today on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean is my co-host and partner in cybercrime, Ryan Morris, principal consultant at Morris Management Partners. Ryan, uh, welcome. How is Athens? Athens, Greece is absolutely fantastic. And I, I, what I would say is go anywhere, right? These days, after a few years of being locked inside, any travel is better than no travel. But if you could have the choice, you might choose to come to Athens, Greece sometime before July because it's miserably hot then. But <laughs> I will say January, February in Athens, Greece, absolutely spectacular, highly endorsed. And that's a separate blog from us on our travel log. But uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll get into more detail on that one later. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, we'll have to talk later. Athens is way up there at the top of my list. Uh, I can tell you about my recent travels to Arkansas as well, although I think Athens is maybe a little bit more exciting. Uh, you know, but it's uh, samey, samey, six of one, half a dozen of the other. A- absolutely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, but listen, we got plenty of co- uh, to cover today, as always. Uh, but some news is always a little bit more important that it can't wait, which is why we want to share with everyone what's top of mind today. So here's your headline. According to a new research report from the Cyber Risk Alliance, a recent poll of 209 security and IT leaders found that the average estimated number of third-party partners engaging with each survey respondent was 88. On the higher end of the scale, larger enterprises featured an average of 173 third-party partners. And what's the point of this? Well, 57% of respondents reported that they were the victims of an IT security incident related to a third-party partner in the past 24 months. Uh, So Ryan, as usual, I'm going to pick your brain. Why is this top of mind for you? The only secure network is a closed network. As soon as you invite in more than one user, connect more than one device, you introduce new, perhaps even you know logarithmically expanding levels of vulnerability and security. As soon as one organization has many users involved in the technology process, we recognize that the difficulty of cybersecurity threat attention and detection and prevention, all of that gets much, much more difficult. And then you multiply it again by your supply chain and every individual organization in it, by your business partners who do work with you, by your customers, depending on the level of access that you use to deal with them in a cyber model. Uh, It is impossible to create a totally secure environment. I think what's most interesting about this, as we move into 2023, economic uncertainties lead to changes in business model structures. Uh, Bradley, you're familiar with recently the uh, the announcements from a bunch of different technology companies in and out of the cybersecurity space, layoffs here, layoffs there. And in every case, what they're doing is shifting their own internal employees externally onto third-party organizations and asking them to perform some of the standard operating procedures of, of the way they run their business. Google is a great example of that, right? They Google's business from a financial perspective is predominantly going to be generated from ad sales. 
and they have just laid off most of the people in their ad sales department and said, you can still buy advertising, just work with a third-party reseller. That's going to happen over and over again as we move into 2023. And as a result, it's going to introduce new levels of vulnerability, new potential threat vectors, and all at a time when we might not have unlimited budgets to acquire new headcount, new tools, and resources to manage these things. So as an MSSP, Today, we are a third party, right? Obviously, uh, physician heal thyself, right? Let's not introduce any vulnerability into our customers' environments, but let's understand that supply chains and business partner, those third party relationships, if that number is, as, as you said, 88 today, I would imagine it'll be 150 by this time next year as we outsource further functions to control our budget costs. I think this is going to be an even bigger issue next year than it is this year. So now's the time to start paying attention. All right, quick follow-up before we move on. Uh, also, according to that report, uh, 52% of the affected organizations reported that the source of the attack was a software vendor. Uh, 39% said it was a business partner, a subcontractor, an IT service provider. Uh, so considering how the uh, the percentages uh, were portrayed there, from an MSSP perspective, are software vendors uh, top priority number one when looking for sources of third-party risk? I think if you're going to, you know, kind of slice it by the the technology that you're paying attention to, software proliferates radically faster than hardware does. And so that, that should be your A number one place to begin looking. But I, I think it's an opportunity, right? As an MSSP, we have a chance to introduce standards and expectations that our clients can use to or impose upon their business partners to at least, you know, hit the minimum floor of basic behavior and cyber expectations. I think that's a very lucrative service opportunity in 2023 as we move into a world of uh, of customers who recognize third-party risk we should have a special offering or at least a dedicated message that we can deliver to our customers around managing third parties in their environment. Uh, the customer isn't going to be able to do it on their own. They're going to look to us to actually take care of that for them. I think we have a great opportunity to introduce some standardization. That's not new, by the way, right? If, if you are a third party tier three OEM supplier to an auto manufacturer, and all you do is make the padding that goes inside the headrest in, in a car, uh, it matters that your network is as secure as the tier one manufacturer in that environment. So we, we should be in introducing standards and the customer can't enforce them. So that should be your job as an MSSP. Bill for that, please. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks, Ryan. Well, that's going to be the top of mind hot take for the day. Do you agree or disagree? We want to hear from you. Please write us at Cyber for Hire at CyberRiskAlliance.com, and we might share your opinion on a future episode. Uh, now, more news later in the show, but first it's time for our featured MSP industry news topic, presenting our big idea in business. Uh, some MSSPs have a hard time leaving their comfort zone when it comes to their tool sets. They prefer to stick to their own tried and true suite of tools and are reluctant to add new ones, even though it might be beneficial to do so. So this, in this interview, we're going to look at how MSSPs can potentially boost their revenues and bolster their business by expanding their horizons and embracing new innovations. And so now I'd like to introduce our featured guest who's going to guide us through this discussion. He is Michael Mayora, founder and CEO of InfoSec Labs, which is a provider of security advisory and virtual CISO services. Michael is a seasoned security executive with more than a quarter century of experience in leadership and consulting roles. He's previously served as the managing director of Cyber Risk at Kroll, and Senior Vice President and Global CISO of Corn Ferry. Michael, welcome aboard today. Thank you, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so, uh, you know, let's jump right into it, Michael. You know, not every MSSP client has the exact same 
needs and challenges associated with them. So why do some MSSPs try to shoehorn or force fit uh, the same old cyber tech stack onto every single client? What's the thinking on their part? That's exactly to the point. The, uh, uh, the world we see as we do security advisory and, uh, and virtual CISO services is that we help companies figure out what do they need. And most of the time, organizations don't have in-house skills or don't want to have the expense of seasoned security professionals to monitor their environment. So they turn to an outside expert. And these MSSPs are those experts. They have lots of abilities, lots of knowledge, and they have a tool set that they tend to use for every client. Now, maybe that tool set is a very, very good tool set. But one of the things I've found over the years is that clients have specific needs and every client is different. So if an MSSP is trying to, as you put it, shoehorn, the same tool set and the same processes for every client, then they're going to have some unhappy clients. And I think one of the reasons we have such turnover in MSSP work is that as a client comes in, if it's a small company, they go in knowing that they're probably not the biggest and most important client, but a bigger company comes in and it expects that they're going to get the royal treatment. I want the white glove treatment. This is what I want to be alerted on. And I don't want to be bothered with this other stuff. That's the challenge for MSSPs. They have to tailor how they do business for every single client. And the downside for the MSSP is that that increases, potentially increases their cost of providing the service. The upside is they'll have happier clients who will come back and increase the scope of work and renew for multiple years. So there's two sides to this, um, increased cost, but also increased revenue. And so um, MSSPs have to figure out what can they do to better serve their clients. And I believe one of the things I'll throw out first is be a little more flexible with your tool set. So everybody knows, well, this is my favorite EDR, Endpoint uh, Detection and Response Program, whatever it might be, product ABC, it doesn't matter. This is my favorite. I'm going to use that one for every one of my clients. And that may be great. Uh, and that tool might be wonderful. But what if you've got a client who's all, for example, all Linux, virtually no Windows? Well, most of the EDR products that service Windows don't do such a good job on Linux. Some of them try, some of them do a passable job, but if you're an MSSP and you've got a Linux house, you're better off using a Linux tool. But that means you've got to change your processes, you've got to change your procedures, and you've got to incorporate new tools. Uh, that could be a cost for you, but it also might be a revenue stream. If you've got a great tool, and I know some great tools that are exclusively Linux, if you've got a great tool that you can bring in, maybe there's a way to say to your client, we will send, sell this to you. We will provision this for you on a subscription model. And now the MSSP is going to make a little more money and the client is going to be a little happier. Michael, I think that the, the question here as you're drawing it out is, the sweet spot, right? We can't use one tool set to saw to satisfy everyone, but we probably can't train up our people to be effective agents using a hundred different tools. So as you're looking to kind of strike that balance uh, with your experience, is it about segmenting customers by vertical industry? Is it about segmenting them by their IT stack? Where Where do you tend to look to find some clustering and, and create, you know, enough critical mass in one category that we can, we can use a tool set for a certain kind of customer. How do you tend to approach that? Well, I don't like dividing clients or customers by uh, vertical segments because there's too much overlap 
between them. So if, as an example, I'm an MSSP, and of course we don't provide that service, but if I were an MSSP and I had a hospital as a client, and I also had a, a financial services company as a client, um, well, they both have some things in common. They probably both have PCI data, credit card data that they have to manage properly. They probably both have HIPAA or personal health information that they have to handle differently but they both have to handle that. So segmenting them by verticals is not the most effective way to do it. I think the most effective way to do it is by looking at their requirements and trying to categorize companies as to the kind of security services they need and the kind of platforms that they use for their services. Michael, you mentioned uh, a couple of different scenarios, really. Uh, you mentioned one scenario uh, where uh, it might be that the uh, the managed security provider uh, does offer some kind of a uh, tool for, you used uh, EDR as an example, but maybe that particular specific uh, vendor's tool uh, isn't perfect for every client. So they might need uh, another EDR tool for other clients that have certain needs like Linux. There's also scenarios where uh, it just might be a certain category of solution that the MSSP is avoiding uh, altogether. Uh, they don't believe in it or they're not ready to innovate in that area. Uh, so I, I, it'd be interesting to talk about both of these scenarios. Uh, with the first one, uh, the example that you gave with the EDR, where maybe you need more than one uh, EDR tool uh, for, for different customers with different needs. Do, do MSSPs, though, run into any problem with that strategy in terms of any kind of like exclusivity deals with, with vendor partners where it would be difficult for them uh, to have relationships with more than one uh, vendor of a, a specific uh, t cyber technology category like EDR? I don't think there are exclus exclusivity issues there per se. Uh, I think that uh, today, especially, the vendors know that there's a very hotly competitive marketplace. So if you're using one particular EDR tool, and I just used EDR as an off the top of my head example, there are lots of other kinds of products that enter into uh, what an MSSP provides. But in terms of EDR, um, if I tell vendor X, um, I'm going to be using vendor Y for this particular client. Um, and that's because you don't do as good a job on that kind of a platform. And because that's what my client wants, I think there's, there's usually a way around that. I think you'll get agreement and consensus. And so I don't think exclusivity is an issue. I think the training part that you mentioned, that's a bigger issue. How do I train as an MSSP uh, my people to be able to use three, four, five different EDRs? Um, well, you don't necessarily have to, well, diversify that much. Um, you talked a little bit about evolution versus standardization. Uh, well, we're evolving into a world where um, products are very specific in what they do. So if I need to train my people, as an MSSP on two or three different EDRs, I don't think that's a big problem, especially if I partner with those vendors and have them come in and teach my people. While that takes some time, they're usually happy to do that because vendors know if they can get their product into an MSSP, it's gonna be recurring sales for that customer as well as for additional customers that MSSP might bring on board later. So it's a win-win. The MSSP gets to train the people on more products and the vendor says, okay, I will give away the training. And they do that, I've, I've seen that a lot. They'll give away the training so that they can, if you will, pay it forward and get more deals and more revenue from that MSSP in the years that follow. I see, Michael. I agree with you on that front. I think more than more than the diversity of technology that we could bring to market, it's that human impact of my team. And is it reasonable for them to understand 
five different tools in five different categories and be equally adept at that. Um, as, as you look to a stack, right, one of the technology questions that always comes up is best of breed versus an integrated suite, right? Do we have one branded tool for every individual component of our stack and the services we provide? Do we try to go for that vendor who has good enough technology, but they cover almost everything in there? Uh, in your experience, is there an integrated suite approach that's even reasonable? Or how do we manage that kind of complexity of best of breed in tool sets? That's a great question. That, uh, that's something I encounter all the time as we're doing uh, advisory services. Uh, I, I come to clients and they say, yeah, we're using this suite. And very often I have to tell them, you know, that particular company, and I won't mention any company, but that particular company has a great EDR tool, but their firewall is terrible, or their SIM is terrible, or whatever it might be. So you might be better off using their firewall, or whichever one I said was good, um, and somebody else's SIM and somebody else's EDR, um, and they mostly integrate together, so if I'm an MSSP, one of the things I want to sell to my clients is an integrated solution, not necessarily a product suite, but I, the MSSP, will integrate them all together, put them into a seam that we have, and we'll ingest the logs and we'll build the rules and build the alerts, which is a lot of work, but it's what it takes. Um, and we will provide you with a single a single throat to choke, as they say, so that if there's an alert, you'll get it. And if it's a false alert, you should only get it once or twice before we figure it out and eliminate the false positives. That, that's one of the things that uh, also comes in when suite versus product. Let me just get one other thought out, and that is um, if you have no false positives, you're missing things. And that's what MSSPs have to get good at explaining to their customers. Look, if all you're getting are true alerts, what are we missing? If you're getting some false alerts, well, now you know we're, we're really checking everything. And yeah, some of them are going to be false. And we'll tune that down. But we're going to try not to miss anything. See, I, I really like your analysis there on if the brand value of integration lives with the vendor, then, you know, a, maybe not all of their tools are excellent, but B, if there is any brand equity there, that's the value to the vendor, not to the MSSP. But if that integration is at the MSSP's level, then what you sell is truly unique. It's your IP. It is your work that you get to bring to marketplace. And that distinguishes you from a competitive sales point of view. Everybody else might have these same tools, but they don't integrate them the way we have. And now it's my brand front and center with the customer as the point of confidence, not the vendor's brand. I really, I really like that approach. That's a great analysis. That's very true. And, uh, and so that, that's what will give uh, the MSSP the ability to, uh, as they say, dig through the mountain and maybe get more business from their existing client and get referrals um, yeah, having been a CISO myself, I know uh, I used to go to lots of CISO events. They don't invite me anymore for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was a CISO, we'd all get together and talk. And we'd say, hey, what do you think about this guy? What do you think about that company? And so on and so forth. And the best source of referrals is when there are these events and I ask somebody, hey, what do you think of Product X? And they'll tell us the best thing since sliced bread. And I'll tell you one funny story. When I was a, a, a global a CISO at Corn Ferry, I needed to buy a product. Um, it was an identity management product. And so I did my analysis and I had my people go off and, and do the various things you do before you buy something. And then we ran a couple of POCs or POVs as they call them these days. And uh, then the vendor shot themselves in the foot because I said, okay, I think I've decided I want to buy this product. Uh, how do we go about it? And one of the things they told me was, well, when you install our servers, whether it's in the cloud or on-prem, uh, you need to leave it a vanilla server. Don't join it to your domain. Don't put on antivirus. 
and don't do patching. And I said, <laughs> have you lost your marbles? I'm going to buy this product to help secure my environment. And you're telling me you want me to put in a black hole. Um, and so coincidentally, so I said, I put it on hold. And then I happened to go to a conference in Southern, at the time I was in Southern California, and I went to this conference. So I asked a few friends of mine, hey, do you use this product? They said, yeah, we do, it's a great product. So they told me, and I repeated what they said, and every single one of my CISO friends said, oh, ignore that. Just join it to the domain, do the updates, put in your antivirus or EDR and move on, because it'll work just fine. And so I called the vendor back and I said, you know, this is what happened. And they said, yeah, a lot of our customers do that. So then why did you almost convince me to go to your competitor? Uh, well, one of the things in MSSP to get back to that point uh, can do for you, they can help you figure that out. So uh, they might even provide that identity uh, product for you. And if they don't, they'll certainly be able to help you configure it so that it works well with their monitoring and stays secure. And the whole idea of putting in a product and not making it secure is anathema to any reasonable CISO. Especially coming from a cybersecurity vendor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's a that's a great story, Michael. And I don't know why they're not inviting you to events anymore. You're you're invited back to our show uh, whenever you like. That's uh, uh, that that much I can at least guarantee you. I wanted to uh, to ask you. Uh, another uh, question here. I, I wanted to go back to that uh, other uh, scenario we were talking about before. Not so much where uh, an MSSP doesn't have uh, three or four different versions of the same category solution, but where they actually just might be avoiding some kind of emerging technology altogether uh, for whatever reason that they're not uh, comfortable uh, with that particular innovation. And I know uh, you had in mind a couple of categories of emerging solutions that you feel like uh, should be receiving more attention and love from uh, security service providers than they're currently receiving. So can you uh, take us through uh, sort of your uh, short list of what some of those solutions are? And then I would just say part two of that question would be, uh, then once we learn what those solutions are, how do you incentivize the MSSPs uh, to innovate more with these solutions? How do you convince them of like what the, the key advantages are going to be, uh, the, the benefits if they do? Well, one of the companies I had in mind when I was talking earlier was a company that does Linux-based EDR. Um, Linux is very different from Windows, as, as everybody knows. Uh, it's got some capabilities that Windows does not have, and it's got some shortcomings that Windows doesn't have. So it's, it's plus and minus. Uh, but there's this one company, I'm not sure if you want me to mention the name or not. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it anonymous for now. Okay. This is a company that has a product that uses Linux specific capabilities so that uh, this happens to be an EDR. And when they get attacked, if they detect a ransomware attack, they're smart enough to know that maybe something leaked and they actually had some ransomware installed because nobody, nobody should pretend to be perfect because nobody is. So they use a Linux capability so that if they detect a ransomware attack in progress that actually got through, they use a built-in Linux capability to back up and restore. So they do the continual uh, snapshot. And if they detect a server has ransomware, they just restore the snapshot. And this all happens in seconds. So you're not likely to lose data. That's a very unusual approach by this one vendor. So. Um, I think it's a fairly new player in the field. So one of the ways I would encourage an MSSP to play with them is to get them together. And I do this a lot. I get vendors and, and suppliers together and we find a way that they can work together so that the vendor isn't losing money and the supplier, in this case, the MSSP, the customer isn't paying a fortune for this product, especially if it's a newer product that needs to make its mark. So that's one of the ways I encourage an MSSP, by working with a vendor and getting them to do it at a lower cost. Got it. 
Um, so whether it's, let's say, a scenario like uh, you just uh, described there, or, uh, you know, again, it could be any kind of a, a more innovative or cutting edge solution that maybe certain MSSPs are, are slow to adopt. Maybe it's a concept that, you know, some people are saying, you know, still needs to be uh, you know, a little more proven or sussed out. It could be something like XDR or it could be like SASE or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, if if you're a, a client that's interested in that and, and your MSSP is, is a little bit more uh, hesitant, um, how do you uh, convince uh, your MSSP that it might be time to, to innovate? What are, what are the advantages? What are the benefits of innovating? Well, the benefits of innovating is, is to have more satisfied customers and therefore enhance your ability to get renewed business. Um, but it's really on the vendor of the product to make it um, compelling to the MSSP. One of the ways that I've done that is by having new vendors provide products for, I won't say free, but nearly free for a limited time. A limited time isn't a POC time. It's a reasonable period of time to give the MSSP a chance to try it out and provide it and see that it's really helping them and that the cost once they start paying is low. So it's really on the vendor to push that. I help vendors do this all the time. I'm an advisor to a number of, of, uh, of security, cybersecurity companies. Um, and that's one of the things I recommend to many of them. You know, don't be greedy. Give away your product if that's what it takes. I did that with one uh, email security company. And uh, I told, look, you know, th there's this client I have. And they're not the biggest client in the world, but they've got a very big name. And I can't, I can't say who they are, but everybody knows who these guys are. I said, give them your product for a year. A year is a long time. But they don't have a big budget. And if you give it to them for, year, for a year, I guarantee, well, guarantee, they'll buy it in six months. So the client said, the company, the, the, the vendor said, we can't do that, but we can give it to them for six months. So I said, okay, let me talk to my client and see what they say. We made a deal. They got it for free for six months. And after three months, they said, we really like this. We want to buy it. But we don't want to give up that extra three months we've got for free. So the vendor made a deal, said, we'll give you 15 months for the price of a year if you renew now, so you're not losing anything. And now they've got a good banner, a good logo to put on their website, and everybody's happy, including me. See, <laughs> see and, and exactly. I think that this is the new layer, right? It's, it's complicated enough to stay up with the cutting edge technologies, keeping, you know, God bless the industry, right? We constantly get new resources, new innovations, and ways to address cybersecurity challenges. But it's the business side that I think we need to pay a little bit more attention to. It's not just, is that tool capable, but is there a good value proposition to my customers? Can I sell it effectively? And are you willing to negotiate those commercial terms on the back end to make it interesting? Uh, as an industry, we tend to become quite fascinated with the technology, the speeds, the feeds, the pieces of software. Yeah. I think we need to make sure we're, we're still equally innovative on the side of business, especially inside the service provider community, because, you know, it's, it, it's competitive enough out there on capabilities. But if you can't make money doing this stuff, um, it's, it's, it's fun to do, but it's not, it's not sustainable to do that. It's so not a hobby. I really like your focus. Exactly. It shouldn't be a hobby. It right. should, after all, be profitable, right? right. Well, um, in these days, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say that's an excellent point of view. And hopefully all of our listeners, you know, become equally expert on both sides of your bit of your brain, right? Your technical brain and your business brain right. got to be innovating on both sides. Right. And, and these days when everything is OPEX, operating expense, uh, you don't buy too many things, you subscribe to them. And that changes the finances completely. It changes the calculus of that completely. 
Absolutely. Um, Michael, this is a great conversation. We could, we could continue to pick your brain, obviously, for hours, but uh, we, we don't want to subject our audience to all of that all at once. Before we let you go, though, we have, uh, another, we have another way of kind of learning a little bit more about you, because obviously everybody who does this for a living, we, we tend to have some things in common in the cybersecurity industry. So we want to invite you to participate in a segment that we call we speak geek we speak so geek. michael from your perspective how do you speak geek well i uh, i didn't start out in security i don't know very many who did especially not uh, as you put it kindly a quarter of a century ago but uh, <laughs> um i i got my advanced degree in mathematics from uc berkeley and i left school and i got a job doing astrophysics for the department of defense and that was a fascinating job for about 10 minutes. And after a while, it got very repetitive. And I, I didn't really like it anymore. Um, I was helping um, determine how to calculate orbits for satellites. I happen to have a prop here. Um, this isn't a satellite I worked on. This is, <laughs> <laughs> I should probably do it like this. Though there is a funny little thing here. You know, when they designed this for the Star Trek series, they designed it to fly like, whoops, like this. But if you're a Star Trek fan, you know that it always flew like this. What happened was they built the model, and when they started filming it, it flipped by accident. Everybody said, oh, this is better. So that's how this <laughs> enterprise. Wow, I never like knew this. that. <laughs> What a great bit of Star Trek trivia. Are you, I, I feel like asking this question completely ignores the fact that you just talked about uh, having a whole astrophysicist background, but, but are you, but are, I'm going to ask you anyway, are, are you a Trekkie? Are, are you, are you really into Star Trek? Absolutely. You collect I a little can put chapter and verse on each of the original episodes and all the movies. Um, and I, I thought, I thought all of them were excellent. Uh, all so, right. What? Yeah. yeah. Do you have a? Do you have? A, do you have a favorite? And there is a correct answer on this. <laughs> My <laughs> favorite of this is is the Next Generation. I thought that was brilliant. Okay. The correct okay. answer was Deep Space Nine, but the Next Generation is uh, <laughs> that's number two. It, okay. Deep Space Nine was number two on the list because it had okay. an incredible arc of a story. Yeah, absolutely right, and and I think that this is this is the deeper analysis that everybody is looking for. Uh, it's not it's not just entertainment. There are philosophies, there are ethical lessons to be learned. Right, uh, I'll, I'll say something that might be just a little bit blasphemous. The new movies, Christopher Pine as Kirk. I think they're brilliant, and I'm really frustrated that the directors have moved on, the story writers have moved on. Uh, so many of the actors that were in those movies make so much money now that they, they don't think it will be feasible to bring them back together for a third in the series of new. I find that highly disappointing because I think that reboot with some younger actors in a more modern environment, I think it was brilliant. It was super entertaining, and I wish they had done a third. There were, there were rumors that Quentin Tarantino was actually going to write and possibly direct a Star Trek movie with, I think, that cast, but I don't think that ever materialized. That would have been yeah. interesting to see. I'd get behind that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I can't imagine what he would do with that. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, lot of, a lot more F-bombs than we're used to seeing come out of the mouths of Spock, I think. Right. Uh, <laughs> um. Well, that's awesome. Uh, that's great. We're, we're going to leave it here, uh, Michael, but uh, thanks for sharing your pastime with us. And we'll have to have a whole separate uh, conversation at some point uh, just about your uh, astrophysicist background and, and calculating uh, orbits. But that's just uh, a little a little too uh, comp. I don't think my, my mind can actually handle it today. Uh, you, to start you know, talking Michael, about when, uh, when we talk with people in the cybersecurity industry, Bradley and I always go into it knowing we're not the smartest ones in the room because <laughs> these professionals obviously do something very complicated. But in your case, the fact that your cybersecurity background is not the most advanced technical knowledge you have, uh, that's impressive, sir. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been no, a pleasure. 
Yeah, no, thank you, Michael. Really appreciate it. Thanks to Michael Mayora of InfoSec Labs for joining us today. Uh, but that's not the end, so don't go anywhere. We're only halfway done. Uh, please return for the second half of our episode featuring our security strategy topic of the week, uh, the impact of generative AI on cybersecurity. That plus our InfoSec News Rundown and our Dear Cyber for Hire advice column. So stay tuned for all of that. We'll see you in a moment on the other side.